much, Ted. And, hmm, thank you very much, Ted, and welcome everyone. So uh, this session today concerns globalization and the pandemic, a reflection on their reciprocal impact. And it is organized by one of our research clusters, one of our six research clusters, the Weatherhead Research Cluster on Global um, Transformation. So this cluster uh, was created in 2017, but the group began working together in 2011 as a Weatherhead Initiative in Global History. It is co-chaired by uh, Chal Mayer and um, Sven Beckert, as well as a few other uh, faculty. Uh, members, uh, the cluster hosts a popular seminar in global history, focuses around uh, themes of the global history of capitalism, and it welcomes an international cohort of postdocs and visiting scholars every year. I'm thrilled that uh, Charles Meyer is with us today. Uh, he is the Leverett Saltenstaub Research Professor of History, uh, and he's a long-standing member of the Harvard faculty. He has trained a great many students during a very long and productive career. And he's a former uh, director of uh, the Menza de Ginsburg Center for European Studies. He's now uh, retired formally, but we are, he continues to be extremely busy with numerous uh, uh, scholarly articles and books. So I will turn it to him. He's agreed to uh, uh, chair today's session and he will introduce our speaker and he will also share some uh, remarks. The Zoom is yours, Charlie. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Michelle, and thank you to the Weatherhead staff for uh, helping me navigate what is still a relatively uh, unfamiliar uh, type of uh, media medium. Uh, I want to first, uh, we have two wonderful speakers today. Unfortunately, the third we had hoped for, Rafael Marquesa de Vizar, uh, had to uh, cancel at the last minute because of pressing university, uh, USB University business in Sao Paulo. Uh, let me say, I'll introduce both of our speakers and then uh, uh, let, let them speak. And then I, uh, I will say if, uh, some words I tried to fill in for Rafael. Uh, Suzanne Berger, uh, I'm gonna be less formal, Suzanne uh, and I go back a long way since uh, graduate school and early teaching. Uh, she is the John Deutsch Institute professor uh, at uh, MIT, uh, and uh, she's the former chair of the MIT Political Science Department. Uh, she originally started working on French agricultural and other interest groups, and she founded, uh, was founding chair of the uh, uh, the, uh, the joint ACLS and uh, uh, SSRC uh, conference group in, in West, West, Western Europe, a time when area studies was uh, really uh, booming. Uh, she had the conception for doing this. Uh, I, I had the pleasure of serving with her on that committee. Uh, she's since then uh, gone on especially to thinking about innovation and economics and the role of the American economy within uh, within the MIT framework. She co-chaired the MIT Innovation Economy Project. She wrote, she's written on this topic, uh, globalization for a long time. Her book, Notre Première Mondialisation, appeared in France. Uh, and in 2013, she, uh, she brought out the making, uh, uh, she, in, um, innovation, making in America, uh, and she's been uh, active in this throughout. So I think we're in uh, a, a great, uh, a, 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 you know, a wonderfully qualified person. Uh, we have uh, Suzanne is a political scientist by uh, by the Guild. Uh, Danny Roderick is an economist. He's the Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at the Kennedy School. Uh, he gave a try to the Institute for Advanced Study, but decided to come back happily. And uh, he's, uh, he, he has published, he's, uh, he's well known for uh, expertise on globalization. And I would say on the cautions about globalization, his most, uh, he published Straight Talk on Trade, 
uh, ideas for a sane economy uh, with Princeton in 2017. And recently, I don't know if it's out yet or it's imminently due or whatever is uh, with Olivier Blanchard, uh, earlier of the IMF, combating inequality, rethinking government's role with the MIT uh, press. And uh, I'm the historian in the group, so we represent uh, three of the so social sciences and thinking uh, sciences and thinking about this project. And uh, I, uh, Danny wrote on his blog a few months ago, talking about that uh, in another context, there were, and I'm quoting, too many jerks in the profession. Uh, Danny is clearly not one of the jerks in the profession. Uh, it will be wonderful to hear him, but first we'll, we'll turn to Suzanne and let her. Okay, <laughs> I hope I'm not either. So this afternoon's topic is the impact of the pandemic on the economy and specifically the impact of the pandemic on globalization. And my bottom line is going to be that just as in our policy battles with Japan at the end of the 1980s, when we accused the Japanese of stealing key American industries, today we accuse globalization and the Chinese when in reality, our most important troubles uh, uh, derive from uh, our own weaknesses and policy failures. It follows then from that, that to these weaknesses and failures, nationalism, whether right nationalism or left nationalism would be the wrong solution. And I think a very dangerous one. In 15 minutes, I can't really fill in all the blanks and links. I probably couldn't do it even with a lot more time, but I'd like you at least to see where I'm heading with my talk. So let me start with globalization and with a very simple stripped down definition. It's the changes in the international economy and in domestic economies that tend towards creating <clears throat> a single world market. These changes come about as a result of the flows of goods and services and of people, capital, and national borders, across national borders. When we remove border level barriers, flows rise. When we raise border level barriers, flows decline. If the world really had a single global market, wages for the same work would be the same around the earth. Uh, if we really had a single global market allowing for different levels of risk, interest rates would be the same and the price of a good or a service would be the same. Well, by any test, the world is far from such an endpoint. So what we really mean here when we're talking about globalization is the increase or decrease in the competitive pressures that tend towards such an outcome. And globalization policy then is what we can do either to open the barriers to or to close the uh, doors and borders to these pressures. Now, globalization has been blamed for many things. And in my view, the most serious of what it's been blamed for is the rise of populism and the threats to liberal democracy. And if it were really true that globalization was the major cause of Trump's election and of the violent politics that produced the January 6th assault on democracy, this would be reason enough for me at least to think that we should be not just slowing down globalization to allow for adjustment, but reversing globalization. But while there's evidence to suggest that globalization did play a role, I don't see globalization or its effects as a primary cause. The first analyses of the Trump electorate did suggest that the new populist voters were manufacturing workers who had lost jobs 
as a result of the surge of Chinese imports. In 2001, after China was admitted to the World Trade Organization, there was a flood of imports and a wave of job losses, particularly in Middle West manufacturing. So for those job losses, globalization policy was clearly the culprit. We opened the borders to low cost products without any buffers or breaks, without any compensation to losers or assistance to devastated communities in which factories closed. But, but was globalization and those whose jobs disappeared as a result of border opening the only or even the main determinant of populism? As researchers have looked more carefully at election results in Brexit, in Italy, in France, in the Nordic countries, as we looked at the research of social scientists like Peter Hall, Arlie Hochschild, Catherine Kramer in Wisconsin, it became clear that populism has much more complex socio-cultural roots. Its new supporters draw not only from industrial workers, but from middle-class workers, particularly from less educated white males. There's much evidence that the sources of deep discontent in our societies derive as much or more from other factors, from social immobility. For example, the fact that a blue collar worker's son at age 30 is not making today as much as his father made at age 30. These, this discontent results from deep inequalities, from low wages, from stagnant household incomes, from racism and historic injustice. So no, I, I don't think that our economic program past uh, and post pandemic should be based on reversing globalization. Though I do think there's an excellent case for slowing globalization to allow for adjustment and accommodation as my fellow panelist, Danny Roderick, and as uh, Carl Polanyi in his time have argued. The pandemic has revealed weaknesses in globalization. And critically, this has shown up in our society's ability to provide essential goods and services during a major public health crisis. The fact that we had to rely on virtually one country, China, for supplies of masks and protective clothing and certain common medications was disastrous. We need to build supply chains for critical goods that are resilient and redundant. It's not certain that they all need to be within our own borders, but they certainly need to be diversified to be resilient. We need far better protection of our drugs than the FDA currently provides in its inspections of foreign facilities that produce almost all of our generic drugs and most of the basic components, even of prescription drugs that are made within our own borders. So there are definitely problems that arise out of globalization that have been revealed by the pandemic and that we need to deal with. And this is also the very same period in which the pandemic, the Trump presidency and Xi Jinping's foreign policy ambitions have combined to make it crystal clear that the relationship between the US and China is on a very dangerous course. Our previous ideas about how China should be integrated into the global economy have turned out to be hopelessly naive. So I would say our old relationship with China is dead, but we don't yet know what new one will emerge. That's not clear yet. And as Gramsci might've said, 
in such an interregnum, a great variety of morbid phenomena appear. And I think that's what we're seeing today. Uh, and so even from the point of view of national security, we now need to think about a national industrial policy that will keep us ahead, ahead technologically of a strategic rival who's moving forward technologically much more rapidly than we are. And here I'd like to quote uh, uh, Larry Summers. In a recent interview, he reminded us that he's never been a fan of industrial policy. But he said, and here I'm quoting him exactly, he said, someone should have done something that assured that there was a serious American competitor in the 5G space, end of quote. So who could that someone be who would assure that there was an American competitor to Huawei. I think the only entity that might have ensured that there was a serious competitor in the 5G space would obviously have been government in one way or another. And I think beyond an industrial policy for national security, we need an industrial policy that will focus on creating good jobs in the United States. And I think a good, the way of creating good jobs in the United States is not beggaring the neighbors or even beggaring China. I think the way to create good jobs, uh, I think in fact that cutting off imports would not create good jobs. It would not raise productivity. It would not raise wages in this country. And I'd like to talk just a little about what we found in the last two and a half years in our MIT research uh, group that's been visiting uh, 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 small and medium-sized manufacturing plants in the United States. These small and medium-sized manufacturing plants make up 90% of all manufacturing companies in the US and they hire about half of all manufacturing workers. Our sample was deliberately skewed towards firms that had done better than average in the period before the 2010 recession. And we'd read all the academic and business hype that we saw in uh, 2017 about how robots were gonna be eating up jobs over the next five to 10 years, all the hype about how we were gonna have self-driving cars on the road by the end of the year and so forth. And so we were worrying what was going to happen to jobs as robots advanced. And so in the manufacturing plants that we visited, we asked basically one simple question. What new technology did you buy over the last five years? And whatever happened to Joe who used to do that job before you bought the robot, before you bought the new machine. So the result from three dozen interviews that we carried out uh, in Ohio, Arizona, and Massachusetts was uh, one new robot purchase in Ohio, two in Arizona, uh, and actually none in Massachusetts in the companies. No 3D printing equipment was purchased. A few new CNC milling machines. And once the pandemic broke out and we were only talking uh, to people online, we heard about lots of people using Zoom. So what we saw when we were still able to visit the plants was a lot of old equipment with some new technology uh, layered on top. For example, in one quite successful Ohio firm, the owner showed us milling machines his father and grandfather had purchased in the 1940s and that they were still using. 
alongside some newer CNC machines. The fact is that productivity, even in large US manufacturing companies, multinationals, has not risen as much as it has in other industrial countries in, in Europe. Profits in those companies in the United States that might have been invested in new capital equipment usually went into stock buybacks. And if we look at small and medium-sized manufacturing plants, their productivity has been almost stagnant. Without productivity increases, wages are not going to rise in these plants. What we hear about a lot is a skills gap. But when we ask the owners and managers what they're looking for when they hire new people, they say, they're looking for anybody who'll show up on time. Anybody who'll show up on time and work for $11 an hour. It's only when these companies get new technology that they suddenly are looking for new skills, uh, that they're suddenly interested in training workers, and that they're willing to pay more than $11 or $12 an hour. And as I said, at these days, they're not acquiring much new technology. So this little slice of evidence that I've just provided you for manufacturing is a slice that I've come to know pretty well over the last 10 years. But I think the evidence is uh, that uh, we're not investing enough in our country in any sphere. We're not investing enough in capital equipment. We're not investing enough in research from fundamental research to the most applied research, we're not investing in people. And these are glaring failures across our society. I think we do need industrial policies and social policies to remedy these weaknesses. But I'm very skeptical about the potential of using international trade policies let's say our, our globalization policies as the main policy vehicle to achieve the good jobs, the opportunities, the fairness and equity that we wanna have within our own country. How much could we really get out of them? I don't think a lot. To achieve this vision of a transformation of domestic society and economy, do we really need to switch from the internationalism of our post-war years to nationalism? Do we really need to, something, to switch to something like the left populism that my fellow panelists has sometimes suggested? Nationalism means more than a state active in economy and society. Nationalism means a state focused on borders and on activating all the differences between us and them. And I think historically, those who have tried to ride the tiger of nationalism have ended up eaten by the tiger with terrible consequences for the neighbors as well. I would suggest rather that we return to an older American vision in which activism to reform our own society combined with an open and generous view of the rest of the world. And so I'll close with an anecdote. Last Sunday was a bright sunny day and I decided to walk down Commonwealth Avenue to see who those statues are that I usually drive past. And there was William Lloyd Garrison, an ardent abolitionist whose entire life and often at the peril of his life was devoted to fighting slavery and racism in the United States. On the plinth of the statue, there are engraved passages from his speeches. And on one side was written, my country 
is the world. My countrymen are all mankind. I'm with Garrison. I think we need to find a way of rebuilding our own society and economy, but that way is not nationalism. Thanks. Okay, shall I? Thank you, Suzanne. I'll turn it over to, uh, uh, to Danny. To Danny now. That was a, was a very inspiring talk, Suzanne, and it surprised me a little. Uh, but that's great. Uh, thank you, Charlie. That, that, that was uh, that was really fantastic, Suzanne. And, and actually, we there's this. Um, uh, you know, there's, we we really uh, agree a lot. Uh, I I would say in, in particular that um, uh, that I think the key point uh, that you made um, that um, the fundamental issues are uh, domestic um, and the fundamental, the most important remedies are going to be actually domestic policy remedies and in the areas uh, you mentioned. I have a bunch of questions about you know what that industrial policy ought to look like. I have worries that uh, you know. Um, manufacturing is not where the good jobs are going to come from, uh, given the trend. So, I think we need to think about a different kinds of different kind of industrial policy. But I think the work that you, Suzanne, are doing have been doing now for a very long time on these issues, and more recently with the with the MIT task force, um, I think has been um, uh, extremely, extremely, um, uh, extremely important. And, and so, I, um, I I'm actually very much agree with the with the general tenor of your remarks. Um, I would not uh, juxtapose um, nationalism and globalization in the way that you just did um, as if they were the as if they were opposites. Um, um, I, I think um, uh, any um, any any system of economic globalization runs on uh, rules which are predominantly provided by nation states today, and as it is a kind of a complementarity between the nation states um, and economic globalization. And I think um, the challenge for us is is to find a kind of a workable balance between those two. Uh, but I hope uh, some of the comments um, that I will make uh, will will um, uh, illustrate uh, what I have in mind uh, by that. Um, so our, our, our topic uh, is um, uh, the impact of, of COVID uh, on, on globalization and, and, and vice versa. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, so one of the key points that, that I, I really I want to um, to make uh, is that um, that COVID mainly reinforces and deepens uh, some of the um, um, some of the, um, I'm going to try to, uh, you know, finding it difficult to talk and, and share my slides at the same time. I really just want to, to show just a couple of, of um, uh, um, figures here, really, not, none of this stuff. But um, uh, so the, the, the first key point that I really want to make is that um, the kind of rupture that we now associate um, in globalization that we attribute uh, to COVID. Uh, is really one that has been uh, in the data uh, for for quite some time. Um, that uh, the, you know, everywhere you look in globalization, actually there were a lot of signs uh, that the, that the pace of economic globalization had begun uh, to slow down. I think this one picture uh, makes the point uh, quite uh, in a striking way that if you look at volume of world trade. Um, and you just sort of you know look at the trend uh, of world trade since 1990. So if you think about 1990 as the beginning of this period of hyperglobalization, um, that sort of green dashed line shows you where trade would have been. But you can also see that uh, the blue line is where the actual um, uh, trend of trade, and that we've already been sort of you know the, the growth trend, the growth rate of world trade has already sort of declined significantly. Uh, in the aftermath of the uh, the global financial crisis, so um, there was already a lot less buoyancy in world trade, and of course now we see this um, second large dip uh, associated with COVID. Um, uh, but the main story here is not really what COVID has done to world trade or is likely to do world trade, uh, but really what what already has been going on now for more than a period of decade, 
uh, that there is uh, something that's happening that's uh, slowing down uh, the pace of globalization. Um, if we look at you know sort of individual countries, and I think uh, looking at India and China is particularly interesting, where you can see this in a in a very very stark fashion. Um, if you look at the um, uh, these two countries, which are in some ways the story of globalization, China obviously much more than uh, than India, um, the very rapid rise in China's export orientation after the 1990s, especially in the 2000s. Uh, but look at what has happened to China's export uh, to GDP ratio, that is its outward orientation um, after around 2007, 2008, um, again, after the global financial crisis, quite remarkably, China's uh, export to GDP ratio has come down by something like 15 percentage points. This is just amazing. Uh, in terms of how much uh, sort of inward orientation there is uh, in the Chinese economy. Now, of course, we don't really necessarily feel it because China has been growing very rapidly. So the absolute amount of Chinese exports is still growing. Uh, but in terms of the, the, uh, the share of, of uh, production that's directed uh, externally has, has really fallen. Um, the, there's a similar pattern that uh, begins later in India uh, but it's still very much um, uh, there. It's more like a five percentage point uh, in India's uh, export to GDP ratio, a drop of about five percentage points since about 2013. But you can see that it's all also there. So in, in other words, you know, these very large important countries um, that have been driving uh, globalization um, recently are actually sort of um, have reversed course. And that's a big part of the uh, picture uh, in terms of um, this, uh, what has already been going on before, before COVID. Now, uh, what, what I wanna talk about is um, you know, sort of the reasons behind this um, slowing down of in, in, in economic uh, globalization. And I think there are sort of two uh, proximate um, causes. Um, uh, one of them is a, a sort of what um, Suzanne referred to as the growth of, of populism, but I think much more broadly a kind of a political backlash um, that is uh, um, uh, that, 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 uh, 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 to, towards globalization. Um, th this backlash is, of course, you know, has a lot of, of, um, of, 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 of uh, causes, and I don't want to go into um, discussion, although perhaps we might do so um, uh, later, um, about sort of how much of it is economic, how much of it has to do with, with globalization per se, um, how much um, um, has to do with more uh, social or, or cultural uh, factors. Uh, but. I think we can agree that at least part of uh, the um, this has been due to um, economic and 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 spatial spatial disparities that has been that is sort of um, the fortunes of relatively well-to-do regions and lagging regions um, that's associated with a whole bunch of of economic changes, but globalization has been um, an important component of that. Um, and I think that's in the advanced economies that has been a key uh, part of the story as approximate cause this political backlash. I think in the developing countries, there's a somewhat different story, which is what I would say is a kind of is a slowing down uh, of the um, export oriented industrialization growth engine. Uh, we know that export oriented industrialization for China is the predominant example of that has been key driver of both growth and, and globalization in, in a lot of developing countries. But for a variety of reasons, this engine has actually um, slowed down. Um, so I would say that this, um, you know, the, the political backlash and the slowing down of the export oriented industrial, uh, industrialization engine are sort of the, pre, the proximate causes of um, the, the reversal in economic globalization or the slowing down of economic globalization. But I wanna really talk much more about um, what I think are the deeper causes of this. And I think, um, uh, and, and I, I wanna you know, briefly um, outline what I think are, are three tensions um, that advanced stages of economic globalization generate. Um, uh, and so these are in some sense the deeper causes of why uh, advanced stages of globalization run into problems. So I think this is uh, maybe Charlie will talk about uh, this more in historical terms, but I think um, there's been a historical tendency for advanced globalization to create um, 
uh, sort of backlashes, you know, going back to the original populist movement in the late 19th century uh, in the United States, of course, the, the interwar period, um, and, and, and more recently with the current period of hyperglobalization. So I think those uh, three tensions, one, I would say, is, is a narrowly uh, economic tension, uh, which is, has to do with, you know, sort of, uh, you know, whether globalization um, uh, increases the size of the pie or not. Um, and here there is the, the main tension is between uh, the gains from trade that come from uh, specialization um, versus uh, the gains, the economic gains that come from productive diversification. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, trade works uh, by um, leading economies to specialize, but there's an alternative longstanding tradition of uh, thinking about economic development that actually emphasizes not specialization, but diversification that is producing more and different things, particularly the kinds of goods that countries richer than you produce. So in terms of going in terms of the history of economic thought, uh, this is sort of the juxtaposition between Adam Smith and David Ricardo on the one hand, who emphasized the gains from trade versus thinkers like um, Alexander Hamilton and Friedrich List um, who that um, emphasized uh, the importance of government intervention uh, you know, sort of industrial policy in today's um, terms uh, and, and, uh, and a significant amount of trade protection to allow that industrial policy to do, uh, to do its job. Um, so that's, you know, that is the reason why, in fact, this tension between the gains from specialization and the gains from diversification is why, in fact, countries that have done uh, the best, such as China, are those that have already always have had a mixed set of policies, um, you know, profit from globalization, but also have an extensive set of industrial policies and selective trade policies uh, that, that promote um, economic, uh, um, new economic, new industries. So you can push, in other words, uh, economic globalization only so much because it, it runs against the, the, the risk that it will um, constrain the space for uh, national governments to do what, what is actually required uh, to, to diversify their economies. Um, uh, the second tension is really one about uh, distributive justice or how the pie is distributed. Um, uh, and, and, the, and, and the issue here is that the gains from trade always come uh, with redistribution. Um, and, and, and this is actually an idea that's baked uh, into trade theory because there is no trade theory essentially that does not imply that the consequence of the gains from trade is that some groups, some regions, some set of people will be left worse off as a consequence of the opening up to trade. Now, worse off, not relatively worse off, not gain as much, actually absolutely worse off. And this is a critical idea in, 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 in trade theory um, that, um, that, that there are always um, uh, uh, important distributional costs. Um, in the current era, I think those distributional costs have been borne by, as, as Suzanne mentioned, by um, many uh, regions that um, have um, had to deindustrialize more rapidly, lost jobs, um, and um, many segments of, of relatively lower skilled um, uh, labor. Uh, but those are, you know, sort of should not have been a surprise. And I think as uh, globalization advances, in fact, the redistributive costs start to loom larger and larger in a quantitatively well-defined sense relative to the net gains from trade, relative to the efficiency costs of re removing border. So once again, the, this idea that distributive issues are going to become very significant and therefore under, under mine support for the open economy is, is very much built in uh, to the um, economic theory um, of trade. So, um, and I think we've been running into that problem as we realize uh, that we have created a lot of redistribution and it's not simply lack of political will to redistribute, it's just that it becomes physically very difficult from an economic standpoint, it becomes very difficult to redistribute, redistribute once those, the absolute amount of redistribution gets so large relative to the efficiency gains. I think the, and the third tension is much more directly uh, a political one. Um, and perhaps I think it's, you know, one might call it a tension in terms of accountability that reap, on the one hand, reaping the gains from trade 
uh, requires a certain amount of uh, discipline and constraint on domestic regulations and domestic policies. So in the gold standard, it was that, you know, you had to abide by the rules of free capital mobility and um, essentially, you know, have your monetary policy run by sort of, you know, the, the, the gold, you know, the supply of gold uh, um, that's available to the world as a whole. So that really constrains whether you can issue credit, what your domestic interest rates are, so forth. But those were the losses um, in terms of your policy space um, that uh, you, um, uh, uh, um, you, you accepted in order to get the gains from uh, free capital mobility. I think that idea uh, that there is a kind of tension between the gains from trade and the gains from regulatory diversity uh, is, is a fundamental um, uh, tension that, that runs across all domains of, of trade and financial globalization. Um, as very simply put, gains from trade are based on arbitrage, but the principle of arbitrage is, 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 is what undermines regulatory diversity. So that means you cannot maintain high rates on corporate taxation um, uh, if finance and corporations are globally mobile. There are limits on your ability to maintain high labor and social standards uh, if your neighbors um, uh, who have access to your domestic market have labor and social standards that are much more lax than the but also carving out space um, uh, to um, uh, Danny is uh, fading. Uh, can we correct? Can Sorry, can you? We can hear you talking, Danny, but we can't see you. Okay, let me see what I can do about this. This has just happened, or? Uh, Yet yeah, you just sort of up. Oh, you're back. I'm back. Okay, I hope I hope I have not been talking. Is this, um, you can hear me and see me now, okay. That was not a cue from us. <laughs> you just okay. popped off, we didn't do it. <laughs> okay, yeah, no. and you, you weren't gone long. Okay, all right, fine. So I think those, um, those I think three um, uh, fundamental uh, tensions, I think are the reason that, um, that, that already um, hyper-globalization was running um, out of steam. And I think, um, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that we're not going to go, go we're not going, that we're not going to go back to the gung ho hyper globalization of the 1990s and 2000s. I think the issue is really finding the, the appropriate balance. Um, so uh, I, I agree again to return back to, to, um, to what Suzanne said that I don't think the remedy for a um, country like the United States or the advanced countries is going to be to be system systematically protectionist. Um, uh, the question is to have a domestic uh, uh, set of policies um, and then to use uh, your policies at the border in a way that um, supports and reinforces your domestic economic strategy. Now, unlike Suzanne, I'm willing to contemplate uh, circumstances when, in fact, that might create reasons for countries to put up some barriers to trade or some barriers to capital flows. But I emphasize that, that the, the, the usefulness of that uh, is only when you have a good economic strategy at home that you want to, uh, to protect. In other words, protection works only if there is something worth protecting. Um, and that means that you do have um, good jobs policies, that you have uh, a kind of a modified um, uh, industrial policy that is, you know, that is, you know, focusing on upgrading the productive potential of your uh, sort of small and medium enterprises in a way that also generates good jobs, innovation policies that are targeted at, at um, um, at, um, uh, at, at uh, augmenting labor rather than simply replacing labor, um, much more widely uh, accessible uh, sectoral labor training programs, uh, because I think that's going to be important. A variety of regional uh, programs um, um, that, that provides you know, customized business services uh, to, to investors in ways that you know, Tim Bartik, for example, has, has written about. So there's a whole range of things domestically that goes actually beyond redistribution through the transfer, through the tax system, through the fiscal system. 
uh, that I think has the potential to sim simultaneously enhance productivity and, 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 and generate good jobs. And globalization policy should be a kind of an, a, an adjunct to that. Uh, it's not, should, should not be the first uh, line of defense. It's a kind of defense for what, what, what exists. And in some ways, I think that would mean going back to a conception of globalization. And I'll stop after making this point. Um, it will it'll mean going back to a kind of globalization, uh, a kind of globalization uh, that's really what the Bretton Woods regime was about. Because the Bretton Woods regime, unlike what preceded it, which was the gold standard, or what came after it, which was hyper-globalization, was really a regime that was very much designed uh, intellectually uh, to be one where the objective was for individu individual nations to pursue their own economic and social agendas, full employment, full use of uh, re domestic resources, uh, with the world economy really at the disposal of that, at, at, you know, as, as, as a means to that end, rather than I think what happened after the 1990s, which was that the domestic economic and social goals became an adjunct, became a means to having an open economy. I think that reversal uh, of our priorities, I think, is, is, is critical. Um, it doesn't mean that we will stop globalization, but I think it will mean that we will our, 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 our policy priorities where they matter the most. So let me just stop here. That is great, both of these. Uh, uh, the, 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 both the contrast and the comments. And you're both looking to the future. I'm a historian, and the historians look to the past. And uh, um, we're very reluctant to draw policy arguments. But uh, I think the historian, I will talk a little actually around the question, you know, how, do, how will the historian look at this, uh, this epidemic, pandemic, and ask what it did and what sense it derailed history or did not derail history? Uh, and the historian is always asked, what can we learn from the past? And in a sense, uh, history is applied history, especially when we think about questions like this. And it's in some degree an exercise in what I would call analog shopping. That is, what was, what was like, what was different? Uh, and the historian is really always asking what is unique and different, not just what is what is similar. Uh, this is actually not my view of what history contributes, but it's what everybody wants usually when historians are called into uh, interdisciplinary forums. Uh, uh, I think history, when it's done well, gives you a sense of the imponderables, how difficult it is to answer questions. Uh, it's more like, uh, you know, what, what, good, what good does going to a concert do you? In a sense, I would say, what good does going to reading history do you? But let me look at some analogs. Uh, I'll do this briefly so we can get to the discussion. First of all, the, the flu pandemic of 1918, 19, uh, which was devastating. Uh, and how, what, what do we learn about it? And there were 500 million cases, perhaps, out of a world population between a billion and a half and, uh, and, and two billion, thus a very high number of cases, and 50 million dead, uh, which was about two and a half percent of the population. Uh, it hit young adults, soldiers particularly, because they were being shipped here and there. It, flu epidemic started toward the end of World War I, spring of 1918, uh, came back with a surge in the fall of uh, to, uh, 1918, and then again in the uh, year 2019. Uh, in a sense, the equivalent of our nursery home dead in, uh, that we've seen, nursing home dead, that we've seen so devastating in the COVID crisis was the barracks crises and the uh, transport crises of uh, of 1919. Uh, so th 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 this was, uh, uh, this had a, a different effect. And what, su what surprises me as a historian thinking about that flu epidemic is how small a cultural ramification seemed to have been. We hardly talked about it. There's some fiction about it. Wonderful story by uh, uh, Catherine Ann uh, Porter, pale horse, pale rider, uh, but it was overshadowed and it was overshadowed because it took place during a great war and at the end of a great war and the task of thinking about the past and the memory was 
uh, honoring soldiers and patriotic sacrifice. And this flu epidemic cut across that. So in a sense, its cultural resonance was partially buried under the landslide of the Great War. Uh, it will be interesting to see whether what we do with uh, remembering the past of the, of the COVID uh, pandemic, when, assuming it will be past. Uh, but that's one analog when trying to puzzle out the, the current epidemic. Uh, the second analog I would suggest uh, to help us think about what is going to last or not last is the end of World War II. Uh, it was expected in, in America and elsewhere that uh, with the collapse of or the reduction of public spending, military spending at the end of World War II, that there might be a collapse in the private economy. Uh, after the war ended. Uh, the, the young Keynesians in the United States certainly worried about this. Uh, but we know this didn't happen, neither in World War I or World War II. At peacetime, uh, GDPs recovered peacetime levels of 1913 and 1938, to take those two dates respectively, uh, within a decade. Uh, by 1948, even for the defeated countries. Now, obviously those first post-war years were miserable years for many people. And the fact that economies recovered their uh, pre-war domestic uh, products is not the same as saying they recovered the, the stock of investment and especially the stock of housing that they had lost during, during that, that war. There was a great deal of poverty, but in some senses, uh, these wars, uh, these wars were overcome in a remarkable way, and uh, uh, there's there's a lot of literature on how and why they were overcome. Uh, we but we also know that the international tr the trading international trade percentage, of, yeah, Suzanne has written in this, and, and it's. And Danny knows about it. The percentage of international trade is a component of. GDP and national incomes did not recover the 1914 level until close to 19, 1980. Uh, so the, uh, it was interrupted by the first war, then the depression, and then the second war. Uh, so, so, but it, is, it was a macro adjustment as to the balance between those two uh, components of, 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 of output, that which was traded and that which was consumed and produced at home. Uh, it also left unprecedented levels of global public debt. The US ended World War II with 120% of its uh, uh, GDP and public debt as 120% of its national income. Uh, by 1950, it was down to 70% and down to 30% in 1980, but then started to climb. It uh, got to 60% during the Clinton administration and up close to 90% by 2010. For some reason, and maybe Danny can explain it to me, there's this magic figure of 77%, which is circulated. It's been used as supposedly the tolerable level of public debt. Uh, which before, before the burden becomes too great for continuing output. Uh, I don't know why that level was chosen. I mean, it was chosen, uh, I guess, by looking at other measurements, but there's, there's no magic to that number. Uh, we've obviously added a great, you know, we've just, we have the CARES Act of uh, last year and the, car, the current uh, stimulus package are adding, uh, perhaps 20% uh, uh, of our GDP uh, total to our, uh, it will be added, added to our public debt. But I, I think that what we've learned from the two wars is that countries can bear this sort of debt. Uh, a lot depends, of course, upon who was, who was accumulating the debt. Uh, in Japan, the public uh, is capable of absorbing uh, it's debt, it buys bonds. In Italy, it's been relatively uh, uh, capable of doing this. The United States and other countries, we've, we've relied on the central bank and that may lead to a, a different sort of volatility. But uh, my, my sense is, and this is in line with Danny's, is that, that what we are experienced with COVID, uh, we will get over it uh, as we, you know, with looking at other 
disturbances or uh, shocks in the past, whether the world wars or the uh, or 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 flu. Uh, what about the contraction of uh, uh, world trade? Uh, Danny has showed you the pictures of, uh, of of this, and I agree with him that this is. Uh, Somehow the, the contraction, the break on globalization or the slowing of it down by these indices has been in the works since the financial crisis of 2008 to 10. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, he discussed uh, the contraction of world trade. I have some figures on the contraction of farm domestic income. Uh, that is countries' investments uh, in other countries uh, 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 assets, uh, usually productive assets, uh, to uh, when they reach a certain level, 10% is usually described. Well, foreign domestic income uh, had uh, was uh, to already to to uh, under three percent in 2010, uh, even two and a half percent in 2014. Uh, and it fell, especially within Europe, your intra-European foreign domestic investment fell sharply. Uh, and it was down to 1.3% in general in 2018, up to under slightly under 2% in 2019. But this decline in foreign domestic investment uh, has been in the works now for a decade and is another index of the slowing down of globalization. Uh, I would like to know, uh, we talk a lot about supply chains, Suzanne mentioned them, uh, and uh, the, the, I don't, the, the, how do we measure the supply chains? Well, we know that the contract, that foreign components in any country's exports locally on a global average have been about 30%. That is 30% of what a country uh, is exporting uh, is really comes is material from something that it's imported from another country first. So that uh, what will happen to this, I think uh, these will probably, um, you know, uh, certainly if Suzanne has her way, but generally uh, we worried about this for medical supplies. We may, uh, this contraction will probably, uh, will probably continue. But, but I agree, Danny, my sense is as a historian, uh, uh, partially an economic historian, that we're, we're seeing a longer uh, adjustment underway. And uh, as a result, COVID, COVID will be seen as an intensifier, an accelerator perhaps of trends. And, and in many cases, wars, great wars and great crises are accelerators of change. When we think of uh, to a wholly different sphere of activity, modern art, the, inno the great innovations uh, of the 20th century were not the result of World War I. World War I tended in many ways to send artists back to traditional forms. Uh, look at British poetry, for instance. Uh, uh, these, these innovations were there between 1905 and 1914. Uh, the, the, the war can accelerate, but the war is not necessarily the, the generator of, uh, uh, of, of, of innovation. Uh, most of the, the, the innovations that uh, some of them in the 1930s in the midst of depression are a period of great uh, innovation and uh, intellectual innovation in, in, in physics and in, uh, and in electronics. Uh, you know, television is there before World War II, but its diffusion is sp slowed by the war. So uh, we, have a, we have a role for uh, catastrophes, which, which is, which is really one of forcing societies to rethink, but building an intensifying or perhaps slowing down uh, uh, discontinuities that have already appeared. And I think this is going to be the way we view COVID to finally, whether it's the economic data or the cultural data. But this brings me to the, what I would call looking for a third analog, and what will be this. I, I don't know what, the, what we call it, the spiritual effects, the cultural effects uh, in terms of global globalization and change. Uh, and here I think, you know, 
we've all been, we're using it today. I think we have to think about the impact of uh, electronic possibilities uh, for communication. Uh, Zoom to take, uh, to, to take the most obvious one and the one we're relying on today. Uh, I think the physicality, the physical aspects of globalization uh, will, uh, will be slowed down. It's less likely for someone to pay, uh, you know, um, you know, five thousand dollars or whatever it is for me to attend a conference in uh, Asia. I've only done this twice, but I mean, or any place. We don't need the same. We won't need. We won't reconstruct, or we will reconstruct slowly the uh, actual physical travel that that, that we had. Uh, but the range of communication will be increased, just to mention uh, our, the, the group we have at the Weatherhead Center, the, the, weather, uh, the cluster on global transformation, which has its external face, uh, the Weatherhead Initiative in Global History. Uh, we can bring far fewer people to our seminars, but on the other hand, we've, we've been conducting these seminars with people spread across the world, uh, Latin America, Africa, India, China, uh, Europe, we figure out a time zone that makes it possible to communicate. And I think that this range of communication will be increased. Now, is this globalization? I would call it more delocalization. Each of us, when we come to one of these seminars, is in a sense without a territory. Uh, we're not there on behalf of our territory, and we don't have a sense, a sense of it. Uh, and but let's face it, this is this is a type of globalization or a type of uh, you know, communication which is there for an elite. Uh, it does raise the in same distributive problems I think that uh, Danny has mentioned for the exchange of products. Uh, and so we are going to have perhaps a stratification of cultural capital, which increases. It's also probably going to be reinforced by just the fact that increasingly the components of, uh, of uh, as, as he alluded, the, the, com the components of exchanged uh, goods and trade are those of services, uh, which are now comp comprised about 25% of, of foreign trade. Uh, that will probably go up. Uh, and we know that services are connected to a type of uh, new, I hesitate to use the word, but it is an elite, those people who are comfortable uh, with using electronic uh, media, uh, those who are computer savvy, et cetera. So I think uh, this is the challenge of, of, of globalization. And in this sense, uh, COVID has just given us a decisive impact forward. All my students now, since last year, of course, now that uh, the few I have uh, are, have become used to, they're not happy necessarily with it, but we, we are online. We are, these, these experiences of intellectual communication, cultural communication, whether I listen to a string quartet, uh, you know, in, in a venue or, tune into it. This is this is this I think is something which COVID has again hasn't necessarily created, but is decisively impacted. And that is what I think will be the hardest to puzzle out. And certainly will take a long time to find out where we what has been created. But I think uh, it's a great question that Michelle Lamont posed the question to our uh, research cluster. It is a great one, and uh, I'm indebted to my, uh, my two contributors. Uh, I think they've given us wonderful insights into it. So let us open it up now for the, for the questions. Thank you. I will try and... Uh, uh, there are 10 Q and A's. Uh, I'll just, for the moment, I'll go uh, uh, to Mr. Trykov, Igor Trykov. Uh, what is your uh, standpoint to Suzanne particularly? Uh, well, but before I do this, let me ask Suzanne and Danny to comment to each other, to me, at, you know, exchange, let's have a brief exchange among the panelists and then I'll, and then I'll uh, take these questions as best I can. So, can I Suzanne, ask a question, you, Suzanne? Suzanne, do you want to uh, 
Can I ask a question to Suzanne? Sure, yes, please go ahead, Danny. So I, I'm very interested in Suzanne's views on, on because you mentioned industrial policy um, uh, many times, and I'm, I'm a, I, you know, I, you know, I'm I'm an unusual economist in that I, I also think industrial policy is, uh, is is something that should be in in, in government's um, uh, arsenal of tools. I, I wonder, I mean, you know, sort of. I mean, the, the question I have for you is, is how, do you, how do you conceive of industrial policy in this new environment um, where, um, you know, the, the, the jobs, as I said, are not going to come from manufacturing primarily? Or do you think that it's actually possible um, to revitalize manufacturing, not just in a sort of productive, you know, innovative uh, sense, but also as a, as a source of significant employment generation? Now, is it, do you think that it's possible to reverse um, the, the employment, the industrialization that has been taking place? If not, um, you know, what, what will the new industrial policy look like when it's deployed um, in, in, in services and similar areas? Well, I do think that it's perfectly possible to imagine a larger manufacturing uh, uh, activity in the United States than we have now. They're now about 9% of the uh, 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 people in the United States who are employed or employed in manufacturing. In Germany, it's about 20% of the workforce. And German wages are higher than US wages and social benefits are higher. And so I don't think that uh, it's the case as some argued, particularly 10 years ago, that uh, we should look at manufacturing the way we looked at agriculture, that uh, you know, in agriculture at the turn of, in the 1900, we needed 40% of the population working in the fields in order to feed the rest of us. And today it's less than 2%. And I mean, the analogy that people like Lawrence Summers made was, well, manufacturing is just gonna be like agriculture. Uh, today, we're just gonna need a whole many, many fewer people. I, I really don't think that analogy was correct initially. And I think as, that as we look at uh, other societies, we can see that manufacturing really uh, remains a vital activity, partly because it links to innovation in a way that makes it very difficult to imagine that we can really have, uh, that, that we could really remain a very innovative society without a, a certain proximity uh, to, uh, to production. But I think that by manufacturing, we need to think of not just making objects where you know it's manufactured. Uh, if you drop it on your foot, you know it was manufactured. But I think manufacturing involves uh, kind of bundles of services and, 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 and um, uh, services and hardware. So, you know, a soft, uh, a, a smartphone, uh, an iPhone is valuable partly because it's a beautiful thing, but also because of the services. So um, I think there is a larger future for what we're calling manufacturing. And um, I think that even with respect to manufacturing, we've been on the wrong track for figuring out uh, how to, uh, how to really change it significantly, how to really create good jobs. I mean, I mentioned this very rapidly, but um, the idea that if only we provide a lot more education uh, through community colleges and all the rest, uh, that somehow this will miraculously result in better jobs, I, I think that's absolutely wrong. <laughs> I mean, I think if, if we would do that, which has a certain, as a teacher, I have a certain inherent, you know, idea that more education cannot be a bad thing, but um, you know, we, we, we might build it, but it's not at all certain that they will come if we build it. And that we really need to start on the other side, that is without more advanced technology in these plants, uh, there aren't gonna be good, there aren't gonna be better jobs and there isn't gonna be a demand for skills. You know, when you hear again and again in these interviews, all people want are you know, workers who will come at, on time and work for $11 an hour, what could transform that situation? What would 
transform that situation is capital investment. And that's where I think government policy, uh, you know, has really needs, really needs to start, really needs to start. And some of the explanations of what's gone wrong here is really financial markets. And that's something we didn't really talk about today, but stock buybacks has, have really diverted capital investment. And um, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot that we need to do here. Oh, it's, if I can add on here, I mean, I think uh, the whole issue of the, you know, the, the, uh, the component of finance and probably legal services uh, in our economy's output is, you know, has changed uh, dramatically. I'd like to ask a question. I mean, I guess it's to both to Suzanne in part, and it's uh, suggested by a comment that uh, Sarah Bans made uh, in the chat function. I mean, if we look at the vaccine, the COVID, the vaccines, and in one sense, some people have said, Suzanne said, you know, the lesson is we've got to be able to produce this stuff on our own and not be dependent. But in other sense, this, the, the innovation and the production of vaccines has been a fantastic, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, affirmation of what global interchange does. I mean, this, there is a certain competitiveness, but we, you know, we are, we, these, these, these vaccines have been produced in Holland, Britain, the United States, uh, and, and elsewhere. And uh, uh, to, to not, to, to, to not, to, to cut ourselves off or to diminish that type of international, I think, uh, what you want to call it competitive innovation, whatever, I think would, would be a tragedy. I mean, I think COVID has, in a sense, demonstrated the need to continue on a track of uh, internationalization, uh, globalization, if you want. But, uh, I don't know if Suzanne, you want to comment or I can... Uh, well, I mean, you know, those of us who were able to um, develop the vaccines here, first of all, it took billions of dollars of, of government intervention. I mean, the government had a guarantee, mm -hmm. uh, a market, uh, to Moderna and Pfizer. Um, and, and secondly, imagine that you're France <laughs> and you now do not, uh, you, you, the supplies of these vaccines uh, that you have not been able to really purchase in adequate quantities for your population. What would you do if you were France? If I were France, I would be pouring money into the Pasteur Institute and, and beating them up for <laughs> why they were, even with their long history of vaccine success, what is the problem that has, I mean, so, uh, and, you know, I would imagine that, um, you know, that vaccine nationalism is going to um, lead to many other countries that have this possibility. And certainly most countries don't have the possibility of trying to develop their own or invest in some way in access. I don't know, Danny, I would imagine, I would love to hear you on this topic and I never got to ask you my question. <laughs> oh, I'm serious. Well, let's give Suzanne a chance to, she's asked Danny for a comment on this. What's add your question on? Do I would say a quick thing on, on the vaccine issue. Um, I, I think the vaccine uh, question really is also a good reminder for us to um, imagine alternative globalizations, because most of what we've talked about here really focuses on globalization and its economic domain. And we've been conditioned perhaps to think about globalization uh, on the economic domain, because when we think about globalization, we think of the IMF, the WTO, the OECD, cross-border capital flows, international trade, global value chains, and so forth. Um, but there's nothing, uh, you know, that's, I mean, Charlie, you mentioned some other aspects of globalization. We can imagine a globalization that's you know, centered on um, the, the World Health Organization, because there are so many true global public goods um, that are involved here. I mean, vaccine, you know, you can't come up, you know, with vaccine development, you cannot come up with a better example of a global public good. So in an ideal world, we would have had a real World Health Organization that's well-funded, that would have, you know, made, um, you know, billions of dollars available uh, for a kind of um, a tournament uh, for anybody who came up with a vaccine. 
uh, the intellectual property rights would be, um, you know, widely, you know, disseminated. So there would be no protection. Anybody could then manufacture uh, wherever in the world. And this would all be spearhead spearheaded by global cooperation and sort of, you know, pre-pandemic planning because people who've been thinking about these things knew that there was going to be a pandemic at some point. And, and in that sense, you know, it, wasn't, it wasn't a surprise. That's not where we chose to put our political capital in. Uh, we did not build a globalization based on serving global public goods and health. We have not been doing it in the area of global um, you know, environmental constraint, you know, issues and climate change. Again, is that, could there be a better example of a you know, global public bad uh, than, than climate change? And yet we, you know, our global efforts there have been very weak. Um, you know, we could have had you know, globalization built on sort of social and human and labor rights where the key organizations would have been ILO, UNICEF, UNESCO, and, and it would be those agencies that we'd be talking about instead of the IMF. So I think you know, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that I think we've, you know, we've gone, you know, we put our, 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 our efforts in a very sort of you know, um, uh, you know, misleading or, or inadequate direction. And I think obviously part of it is um, that we've had you know sort of vested interest corporations, financial institutions that have been pushing us in that way. But there's also been a kind of a cognitive capture that we have in some ways you know reflected in our own discussion here that when we talk about globalization, we're reverting back uh, to issues of uh, trade and investment and financial capital. Whereas I think you know if we look you know to the future, we should say we really should strengthen global, governance in those areas where the global public goods are really very, very significant. And that's going to be issues like public health, uh, you know, environment and climate change, change, social and human rights. I mean, those are true global public goods. The world economy is not a global public good. Uh, wow. Suzanne, do you want to get, ask your question or address yes, and My question for Danny would be, you've written about, uh, uh, you've said in, in interviews, perhaps we need a left populism. What do you mean by that? I, I think, I, you know, I, by left populism, I really am I'm talking about sort of, you know, you know, something like, um, you know, the U.S. progressive tradition that then goes back to the uh, to sort of, you know, U.S. populism the, of the late 19th century that was much more focused on economic remedies um, to the problems of the middle and lower middle classes. Um, and I think, um, so I don't talk about nationalism much. I think patriotism is a virtue. I think it does matter. Um, and I, I think the questions are that, you know, as I think you just said, these are, you know, the, the, the issues that are, um, are, are going to, need, will need to be resolved are one that will, will, will require us to drop some of our technocratic approaches to po po policy. So I think we've gone in the last few decades um, in, in a direction where we increasingly, um, of course, you know this from the example of the European Union, where it's a kind of an you know, extreme example where a, a lot of, of, of policy making have been left to, to technocrats in Brussels or the you know, European Central Bank and increasingly uh, you know, politics and the discussion around politics have been sort of distanced um, with, I think, a kind of, you know, a, you know, a chain of delegation that in many ways is too long. So I think, you know, in, in all kinds of a lot of the economic domains where, you know, we've, we've emphasized for good reasons sort of price stability and central bank independence, the autonomy of regulatory institutions, um, uh, you know, the evolving uh, autonomy or responsibility or sovereignty to international trade agreements. I think in a lot of these areas, I think we've gone in a way too far in a way that sort of not only constrains because I think there's still a lot of room for maneuver domestically, but I think co cognitively constrains domestic policy makers to uh, to prioritize um, the international economy at the expense of domestic economic uh, uh, objectives. So for example, you said that, you know, in the 2000s, there was a lot that could have been done um, to, uh, to, to, to protect domestic US workers, not necessarily through trade protection, but maybe going slower on letting China into the WTO, maybe more adjustment assistance whatsoever. It wasn't so much that the regulations that we signed on to that prevented it, it was much more the kind of you know, 
approach we brought in. I mean, you know, Clinton basically said, look, you know, globalization is like a force of nature. It's the, it's the, it's the you know, it's, it's the social equivalent of wind and, and water. There's nothing you can do about it. I mean, this was our, 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 our attitude that you just have to grin and bear with it, no matter that people were. So I think, you know, that's, I just need to, I just think that we need to sort of reverse that attitude. I don't care what you call it. I've called it left populism because I think um, for analytical reasons, um, given the context in which I was discussing populism. But I, I do think the key thing is to prioritize uh, domestic economic needs. Uh, that's fine. I could just say, looking back on, as a historian, it's, it's very hard. You might want a left populism and you end up with Trump. Uh, you know, these, these ways, getting the equal balance right between, uh, you know, in this case, I mean, the, the, you talk about technocrats in Brussels, but, you know, on the other hand, you want governance, at the, you know, of, of, in, in a way for the World Health Organization, which would, I agree, I, we, we, you know, we, we just uh, de demonized the World Health Organization in our last administration. Uh, but uh, it's, it's not, these, these forces in a certain sense, are, you know, directions are very hard to, to control. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't try, but uh, it's, it's not surprising that, you know, the, the, the spirits we evoke or uh, we call them up are gonna, you know, sorcerers or apprentices are sometimes gonna uh, um, bite us back. And uh, I think perhaps uh, I, yeah, I, I take it, I take it, uh, I take Suzanne's, you know, it would be good if we had to pay, we had to pay a lot of for these, these drugs. Uh, and I think we'll all agree, we'll all agree it's been worthwhile until a couple of years from now we see scandals about, you know, payoffs, uh, fantastic uh, uh, bonuses to the executives of various companies who produce them. So uh, is course correction is required all the time. Uh, the uh, we did have uh, the uh, uh, the uh, I'm trying to look for the uh, Q and A. I'm gonna let this go. Uh, the Mr. Trikoff has uh, has has um, uh, raised several questions. Uh, it's about about intellectual uh, property. I mean, I think the questions are really about your remedies for Suzanne. What's, what do you, what about uh, intellectual property? Uh, how does that, get, how should we get deal with that? And uh, for Danny Roderick, he asks, uh, 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 history repeating. I'm not sure these, uh, uh, these, these are pretty uh, specific questions. I'm not sure we can get into all of them. Uh, the uh, Vanyo Moraes has asked the question about global value chains. Uh, are they going to become more integrated or will, will they become less integrated? I mean, you've each said something about them. Uh, do you have anything further to add on that? Well, on, I mean, on the intellectual property theft, I mean, change you know, is property change. I mean, we, we, we all talk about it. Should we be trying to disaggregate Prop, you know, uh, uh, oh. you know, uh, uh, whatever we call uh, the, the, the investment chains, or in perhaps intellectual intellectual property chains. I don't think you can really disaggregate. But that uh, is this a particularly vulnerable area? Uh, commodity chains, I guess, is the term we use most the most often. This uh, uh, for Danny, I think. No, well, it was for either one. And I'm gonna throw out a few questions because our time is limited. And then I'm gonna ask you to each respond to what you want. Jonathan Seitlin, who is on, our, uh, uh, is on this conversation, asks, asks Suzanne, uh, uh, you, how do you explain that the companies you used in your, uh, in your surveys that you visited were both uh, uh, we're, we're not innovating technologically. Their productivity was stagnant, but that many of these companies were doing well economically. And what is the implication of that uh, for industrial policy? Uh, and 
uh, 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 what we did was I was trying to suggest that, um, in fact, the sample we chose were a set of companies that between 2004 and 2008 had doubled their revenue. That doesn't really mean that these companies were world beaters, but it, it was a way of trying to identify manufacturing companies that on the eve of the financial uh, reset, of the financial crisis and recession were reasonably healthy companies uh, because uh, our questions about um, about uh, tech, you know, whether they're buying new technology, how they're organizing their business. If companies are already in deep trouble, these questions really don't have too much meaning. So we were trying to find at least more or less healthy ones. And so these were companies that were better than average in respect, in the respect of having increased their revenues and hire, hiring more people, even today. These companies, actually, I was surprised that uh, these companies, many of them we had visited in a, period, uh, a prior phase of the research in 2013, when we went back to them in 2020, all except one uh, were hiring more people. So they're still doing, they're still doing relatively, relatively better. But I would say they're frozen in what I call a low tech, low skill, low wage equilibrium. They're stuck in a kind of, what I see as kind of a dead end trap. They're not going out of business. They're not, they're providing jobs, even few more jobs, but not really well paying jobs. It's a kind of low skill, low tech, low wage uh, equilibrium where companies can you know, continue quite a long time. Let How me do get out of that. That's the question. Let, let me, as a, I guess, a final question. I've looked at the questions. Many of them are on specific policies, and I'm not sure we should be debating, you know, whether we increase this tax or that tax or whatever. But as you look to the future, uh, I mean, or, you, you know, given the trends that Danny said are, and which I agree with, are longer term than COVID, but given the way we've reacted to COVID too, uh, are you hopeful about these changes that you think are uh, hopeful about our making these changes that you think are, are uh, you know, are the ones that appropriate ones that we should be taking away from this experience of COVID and the like? I mean, do you see shadow sides? I, I raised the question of, you know, redistribution on an intellectual level more than a wealth level, but there's, Suzanne, Suzanne has uh, policies that Danny, so will we, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, uh, do you think we'll have gone in this direction that you both would hope would, we would go in? I mean, I'm, I'm reasonably hopeful. I mean, I think what has happened, which I think is very important, is, is that, you know, that we had an intellectual consensus about what uh, reasonable, responsible governments do. Um, and, um, and that intellectual cons consensus outlived its usefulness. Um, and I think is, is sort of is responsible for many of the problems uh, we have currently, most visibly, of course, problems of inequality, economic insecurity, and 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 um, and, and, and and regional um, uh, uh, inequalities. Um, and I think so. What has happened is that that this this solution of that economic consensus, uh, whether you want to call it the Washington consensus, you know liberalism, market functions, whatever, that the, the solution of that consensus, I think, has opened up space uh, for um, uh, essentially a certain degree of experimentation that, that is now going on. I think this, the most recent act is full of that. I think that there is some, you know, much greater room now for uh, governments uh, to be trying to do things than they had in a while. So I think we'll, mess, we'll have some mistakes, I think, but I think we are, I, I think that it's a time of ferment in terms of policy experimentation. So that gives me some reason to be to be hopeful. Suzanne, would you venture? Well, I, I have a sort of, I mean, what I think in a way I 
have share the kind of optimism that Danny just expressed, but I have a deep worry that our relationship with China and the increasingly hostile uh, elements of that relationship are, are going to have very negative spillovers into uh, all domains and into the economic domain as well. When I look at the pressures, let's say on US universities, uh, in the very realms in which we ought to have the freest flow of ideas and knowledge and students and researchers, the pressures that we are now uh, facing to close up, to me seem a kind of ominous uh, kind of foretaste of what, you know, what we might be facing across the economy in the future. So I do have deep worries about that. Uh, yeah, I, sh I share some of these worries and I, I share the worries that, you know, the episode of, let's call it right-wing populism that we lived through for four years has, has not yet exhausted itself. Uh, so uh, anyway, there are a huge number of questions to ponder here. Uh, I think our time is up. I'm immensely grateful to you too. These are uh, perspectives which are were wonderful to hear. Uh, I'd like to spend more time uh, thinking about them, discussing them, and we will think about them, but together, I wanna thank the Weatherhead Center for giving us this chance to, if not answer every question, uh, raise, raise them, and to the Weatherhead staff for uh, helping me get through a uh, technological uh, experience that I'm not, that I'm born too early for. Okay, so thank you all for having, uh, for having participated. Uh, and uh, I let's see each other at other in other venues. Thank you both. Thank you. Ciao.